Hello and welcome to episode number three of the Abundant Living Ecuador podcast. I am here with Jesse Bayer uh, with my partner Darnell Dunn. As usual, um, we are joined today by a guest, Greg Gideon, who is a local uh, expat and business owner here in Loja. Um, We hope we have a great show for you today. I'm uh, I'm a little excited, but also uh, disappointed. You know, my, my Mets are in the playoffs, something that has not happened in quite some time. And this is the first, well, actually, if I'm honest, the second year that I have watched zero baseball games. So after many years of suffering and hardship, uh, my Mets are in the playoffs. However, I probably know no more than four players on the team <laughs> and uh, don't get to appreciate it the way, I, the way I would have liked to at one time. Although I've just heard from our friend Greg that we can watch the playoff games at his bar. So I'll be doing that. Uh, this weekend, and you know, if we last more than the first round, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps for the next few weeks. Well, they got some pretty good pitching, don't they? Very good pitching. Um, apparently, average defense, and the hitting has been great over the last couple of months, although terrible before that. So, we shall see. But um, before we get into today's show, I just wanted to mention a couple of properties that we have listed that are um, worth mentioning, just because of what exceptional opportunities they are. Um, starting with, starting with a house, um, you'll find on the website, I believe it's under tasteful luxury, tasteful luxury. Thank you. Um, so this was a house that has been on the market a while. Um, the owners had it listed at $1.75 million. Um, it's worth that. It's, it's, uh, from my perspective, really, it's, it's the nicest house I've seen. And I, you know, saw a lot of nice houses in New York. Um, but it's certainly the nicest house I've seen in Ecuador by a lot. Um, you know, I joke that if this house was in the Hamptons, you know, it would be a $40 million home, um, which it would be. The owners um, who built this house just did so with such meticulous planning and execution and materials and so on that it's really just, it's really just an amazing property from a, from a perspective of quality and planning and those types of things. And it's also world-class luxury. Um, anyhow, they, they need to leave Ecuador and they've asked us to lower the price to a million dollars, $999,000. Um, you know, they just need to sell and get out of here. It's, it's something that, uh, if I had the capital right now that wasn't tied up, I would buy, um, for any investor who's looking for, you know, luxury estates around the world, you know, this is a, this is being sold close to half price. Um, it's the kind of thing that if somebody were to buy, um, either to obviously to live or to hold, but you know, additionally, if somebody wanted to buy it, rent it out, and put it right back on the market, it would fetch between twenty three and thirty one or thirty two hundred dollars. In monthly rental income, it has three three pro- houses on the property, um, a main house, a guest house, and a caretaker's house. I mean, the caretaker's house I would live in in a second. It's it's nice. Um, so you could you could pull in about twenty two to thirty two, approximately hundred dollars a month in rental income, and you know put it right back on the market at one point six, one point seven, one point eight, and you know and you know sell it in in some some you know not unreasonable period of time. Um, you know, the market here is changing. One of the reasons that properties like this are on the market here unsold is because Ecuador is just not on the map for that many people worldwide, certainly not most international investors, but that's changing. So if you've got six months to wait, if you've got nine months to wait, um, you can get a true value price for this home that you just can't get right now. Um, so that's something worth mentioning. Um, we'd love to chat with any investors out there about, uh, you know, the dynamics of how to, how to execute something like this. We've got some ideas for it. And we just recently signed a hotel that is also on the website. Um, the hotel is, is Madre Tierra. It's located in Vilcabamba. The other home is also located in Vilcabamba, which we've talked about before, but it's a, it's a great place to live. Um, the hotel is profitable. It's well in the black, and it's profitable with the owners having no budget whatsoever for marketing, having two bars that are not current, they don't currently use, they don't, they don't use them because they don't want to spend the time managing the hotel, part of the reason they're selling it. 
but no marketing budget, two bars that could be exploited, which are currently not, and the restaurant is currently closed to the public. Um, the hotel is a spa. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it could be an international destination. It has a conference center. So, so a real, also a great investment. Um, they're asking, you know, 1.2 for the hotel. Um, even at current current income, uh, it, it would pay for itself in, I don't know, 10, 12 years. If you tripled the income, which you could very easily do if you put a little money into it in terms of the marketing and um, opening the bar and restaurant and turning it into a conference center and those kinds of things, it could pay for itself in just a few years. So just a couple of things we wanted to throw at you before we got started. Um, so let me introduce our guest, Greg Gideon. Uh, Greg is from Arlington, Texas. He's been in Ecuador for a number of years and owns a local bar, Zarza, here in Loja. So uh, Greg, why don't, you, why don't you start with just telling us a little bit about your story, how you ended up in Ecuador, and uh, what it's like being here. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. Uh, Let's see, about 10 years ago, I graduated from a acupuncture college in Oregon and uh, was really just looking for a place to open my practice. So I went traveling through the States, didn't really find my spot, and then uh, decided I was just going to be a backpacker for a while, figure things out. And so I bought a plane ticket to Santiago de Chile and from there traveled for about a year, uh, met great people on the way, got to Ecuador, and then uh, was heading back south to go to uh, Argentina, which I didn't get to see. And uh, funny enough, in Madre Tierra, uh, where I mm -hmm. stayed, they gave me a job. And so I started my acupuncture practice there, uh, eventually uh, branched out, uh, ran two offices, two clinics, one in uh, Vilcabama, one in Loja. Did that for about three years, and then uh, uh, had my wife, uh, met my wife, we had a kid. Uh, went back to the States four years and then came back here and started a new project. Met your wife here in Ecuador. That's right. Yep. I met her in Vilcabamba actually, just oh, okay. randomly. Yeah. And you lived in Vilcabamba for a little while. Yeah, I was there for about two and a half years with my practice. Uh -huh. What years were th what years were that? Uh, let's see, 96, uh, 95, 96. I mean, 05, 06, uh, uh, you know, yeah. whatever, the decades fly. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. 05, 06, I'm not that old. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got back a few years ago? When did you get yeah, back? Yeah, we got back uh, three years ago, three years ago in August. Oh, wow. Last so, August, yeah. so, wow, you've done a lot in a short time with the bar. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the bar came about uh, actually 10 years ago when I was first living here. I uh, started missing having a decent beer, and right. uh, so my dad came to visit uh, his first grandchild and brought me a homebrew kit, started brewing, never stopped, even when I went back to the States to live for four years, and uh, yeah, it turned into a, a microbrew business. Yeah, I mean, Greg's business is very cool. You know, he has a, he has a bar here in Loja. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a bar. It's a popular bar, and you, know, you can see the facilities where he brews his beer in the bar. So it's, you know, microbrewery slash bar. Um, and, you know, the only place in Loja where you can get a decent beer. Um, so it definitely fills a nice void for, you know, foreigners and Ecuadorians alike in terms of having some variety for, for beer choices. Right. It's also an expat watering hole. Anybody who's passing through Loja at any point, they, uh, they end up congregating at your place. That's right. And all the, all the new expats initially start out at our place, too. That's where they find out about... Uh, interesting things to do or apartments for rent which we of course pass along to you guys so. <laughs> <laughs> so what um what tell tell us a little bit about you know your experience in ecuador what do you like about living here and in, in ecuador and loja specifically what you like about living here maybe some of the things that you know drive you nuts about living here yeah you know uh i would say the my favorite thing right now is probably the climate uh it's you know it's interesting because the the average Lohana will tell you that it's very cold here. Right. Whereas uh, I'm from Texas and uh, I can't deal with heat. Like I don't want to see the sun anymore. You know, that's not <laughs> true. But I don't want to feel that summer heat. You know, I mean, when the sun comes out here, it can be a little bit uh, abrasive at times. Just for the UV index, it's pretty high here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, um, we don't get more than a couple hours in a row of sun here so you know it breaks up pretty nicely but overall the the temperature is awesome i think i mean you don't need central heat central air uh it's really great to me um it's always green because it's always misting at least once a day you get a little bit of rain it seems 
Um, if you go like five or ten days without rain, it's really bizarre. So uh, some of the tough things for me are, uh, let's see, I think there's uh, some cultural norms that we have when we live in the States that uh, we take for granted. And then uh, when you come to a, uh, some another place where they don't really have the same uh norms or ways of thinking they can clash and as a personally i mean as an Amer a north american uh you can take those things personally which is not what you should be doing i mean they're just differences in culture and uh they seem offensive to uh a north american at times but it's not personal you know yeah we've actually touched on that before what what do you have any uh specifics oh, in terms of what uh, you're much, thinking how about how much time we got here <laughs> uh, let's see, about uh, 45 minutes <laughs> yeah. well uh you know, uh, driving is a very interesting proposition always. I mean, the light will be red and they honk before it turns green. Like, <laughs> And, uh, you know, being from Texas and, you know, you can't carry a gun down here. Uh, you have to think about, like, should I get out of the car? You know? <laughs> no. But no, it's not true. Actually, uh, my wife, she helps me out a lot. And, uh, she, you know, I was just talking to her about this the other day. And she's like, you know, I think they're just saying, hey, buddy, get ready. You know, it's time to go. <laughs> They're not just saying, you know, cussing at you in their heads or anything. Right. So uh, right. that, that's an interesting thing. Uh, you know, it's the same thing with uh, making a line in a, at a bank or somewhere, you know. It's like in the States, especially in the West, I don't know. I think in New York it might be a little different. But at least in the West of the U.S., uh, you have like a, a yard and a half of space around you that no one's allowed to enter, you know. It's <laughs> personal like, space. Uh, personal space, yeah. And uh, if you That leave, doesn't exist here. If you, leave that, if you leave that space in a bank line, I mean – Ten people are going to occupy it, <laughs> and you'll never, you'll never be able to make your deposit. So, <laughs> but you know, it's just different. So, yeah, now I, I always rub up against the, the old lady in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> you've you've accepted the old lady rubbing. That's right in, in the line. Yeah. This is part of being Ecuadorian, you know. <laughs> and I, I am Ecuadorian, by the way. I have du dual citizenship now. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. And um, what was that process like for you? It was actually pretty simple. I hear it's, you know, it, laws change quickly here, which is sure. a, a tough thing in business, but uh, sure. uh, visa laws especially. But, you know, when I did it two years ago, uh, you didn't have to take tests yet, which now, you know, there's some cultural uh, heritage tests I think you take. They're not a big deal, I've heard. But anyway, for me, it was like just uh, submitting paperwork and signing on the dotted line. Now I think they might even include a ceremony, but at the time it was like they just gave me a sticker. I literally, <laughs> I got a sticker. Sticker's better than ceremony. That's either. right. Yeah. It was a holographic sticker. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, speaking of uh, of business, talk a little bit about um, your likes and dislikes with business, and how some of the cultural differences impact you know your your work life. Yeah, yeah. Starting with the, the positives. Uh, if you if if somebody can come here with a new strategy or a new idea or concept, I mean, you can do amazing things. Uh, the standard business practices here are to look at what your neighbor does and then copy it. You yep. know, and I mean copy it exactly. Not yep. even not even not even innovate. You know, so if you can think a little bit outside of that, I mean, you can do a lot of amazing things and provide services that don't exist. You know, yes. All you need is time. On the other hand. You need lots of time because uh, the paperwork process here is a nightmare, especially if you start a new business that doesn't exist. There might not be permits in their systems, you know, like our business here in Loja. Uh, it took a while just for them to even understand what we were doing. You know, they didn't know you could make beer, you know, they thought it came in bottles. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it took a while to get through that. And, you know, we're set now, but it's very interesting. Yeah, navigating the bureaucracy is, is not a whole lot of fun. Not fun. And, uh, you know, you have to have tons of patience. And uh, really, you have to have someone dedicated uh, to that job. So, an administrator, really. Mm -hmm. And what about, I know in the beer brewing process, you need a lot of equipment that you can't get here. How does that work? Okay, yeah, well, uh, we brought in all of our equipment overseas, from overseas at the time. Uh, since I was married in Ecuadorian, we had the benefit of um, bringing it in tax-free. So like Ecuadorians that live outside the country for more than a year can bring in a container free. So we took advantage of that. That doesn't exist for a lot of people, especially expats coming in. Um, so there's another paper trail there that you have to work through and permits for bringing in equipment. We also bring in our own, um, all of our um, insumos in Spanish, all of our grain and mm -hmm. hops. Uh, from overseas and that's always a nightmare but 
it's a little smoother now uh even though taxes change all the time they've gone up because there's a there's some economic problems here right now with low oil prices but uh um you know we're able to for now we're eating that portion of uh the customer's uh beer you know mm-hmm. of the cost of the yeah <laughs> yeah so so you've seen you've seen some taxes go up in the last year or two on your input space oh yeah. man yeah in february uh we were paying about 40 percent overall and all of our things that we bring in you know every two to three months they just add another tax on top of that that's 45 percent, and it's a part on top of it so i mean it's pretty bizarre but supposedly it's 15 months although i've never seen <laughs> countries withdraw taxes once no, they're in right. place that's uh, a tariff right yeah tariff it's a they call it a safeguard uh-huh. yeah in spanish salva guardia <laughs> <laughs> right that sounds really official Greg. oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's a new government airplane financed by that oh of course yeah. safeguard <laughs> <laughs> just be sure and um, we were t- chatting a little bit offline about some new v- developments that you have going on at Zarza Brewing Company. Oh, yeah. You know, we try to bring in uh, different cultural experiences from around the world. Uh, that's that's what our, our main mission is at our business is provide an experience to customers that they're not going to find, uh, out, well, at least in Loja, but that, that could be repeated perhaps in North America or in Europe. You know, the idea of uh, having regional brews. So uh, one of the things we're doing this year and we'll do every year is uh, an Oktoberfest. So our, we're in our second week of Oktoberfest um, for the next three days. Uh, we've been making uh, uh, German food. Uh, we have very interesting uh, outfits that we have all the <laughs> girls and guys wearing, including myself. And then uh, we're all we're singing lots of uh, German, uh, you know, bar songs and stuff together, giving away beer to customers that are really into it. So. <laughs> it'll, it'll be interesting tonight, especially with the Ecuador Argentina soccer game. So, football. Football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then um, you were recently started bottling your beer, correct? Oh, that's right. Yeah. We uh, finally have our permits in order for, for bottling. And uh, we now have um, four of our main beers in bottles at all, the to- at all times, you know. Uh, we're looking at distribution opportunities with perhaps Super Maxi and also uh, a local liquor distributor here in Loja, Amavi. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, those things are all in process right now. But yeah, it's a new new chapter for us. So it's very it's very interesting to me how in line your comments are with our thoughts on the pros and cons of doing business here. You know, it's just. As you said, I mean, the thing that struck us when we got here and, you know, spent the first couple of years here is just how many opportunities there are, you know, exactly as you said, just how many things just aren't here. There's just lots of businesses you could open and be the first person doing it and, you know, introduce something that's really popular worldwide and, you know, would be very popular here, but there just isn't. I mean, come, you know, something comes to mind, for example, you know, Loja is, you know, something like a quarter million people, 200, 250,000 people. There's no bowling alley in Loja. Um... You know, as an as an example of many, so you know there was before your bar, there was no uh, you know bar that you could get beer outside of you know the beers you can get at every bar. So um, you know, tons of opportunities in those ways, and yeah, the drawback is is you know dealing with the government and the taxes. Yeah, you know, there's like I always think too. There's I bet there's 200 bakeries in Loja, right? At least you know, but. Uh, None of them do really breads that are outside the box or right. uh, German breads or really art- artisan breads, you know. They're all artisanos, you know. They're people that craft their own product, but they're just repeating what the, the norm, you know. And there's a lot of opportunity, especially with uh, as many foreign influences, not just expats or tourists, but, you know, a lot of Ecuadorians uh, live abroad and then eventually come home and mm-hmm. uh, they bring their new uh, tastes. tastes. Yeah. Yeah. So... Thinking outside the box is the key. Yeah, and do well doing something you love too, you know. Sure. Yeah. No storage unit in Loja either. You know, no, yeah, no place amazing. to store anything. Yeah, no there's no uh yeah, no no public storage or anything. Yeah. There is in Cuenca now. It's is re- there? It's, oh, there's it's one. amazingly expensive. Oh, I don't is know it? if you're listening in Cuenca. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it's uh got interesting pricing. You should look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Very diplomatic of you, Greg. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and of course, it's their expats that are running it, you know. 
it's people that have sure. come over and uh yeah realize that there's a niche so yeah yeah and i mean you know i would say you know loja is kind of in a similar excuse me a similar place to cuenca 10 years ago or or whenever it was when you know foreigners started moving to cuenca foreigners are just starting to discover loja now so those kinds of businesses, you know, for example, a microbrewery or a storage company or, you know, these types of businesses that cater to the foreign market, you know, you're, you're looking at a growing demographic of foreigners in Loja right now. Oh, yeah. And, the, you know, the beautiful thing, beautiful thing about the, the ex, Loja, Lojano expat is that uh, there, it's a certain character type, like uh, um, they, they usually come from overseas or directly from Cuenca or something where mm -hmm. they're trying to look to, to be more integrated into local culture. Uh, there's not a lot of expats here, so they're not coming for an uh, exclusive expat experience, you know, although, you know, the, everyone misses uh, parts of their culture. So that's why they end up at Zarza. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's why I made the place, you know, I was right. missing it when I lived here initially. But anyway, they, it's a certain type of very respectful expat that respects the local culture, wants to be a part of it. Almost, I would say all of them actually are trying to learn Spanish or have a background of some mm -hmm. sort and want to uh, really grow that part of themselves. So uh, I think where there's a lot of um, expat communities already in, uh, um, in situ, uh, established. In certain, established in certain places, uh, like Cuenca, perhaps, um, it's real easy to fall into just living your standard life that you already know back in the United States or other parts of the world uh, because you don't have to integrate. You know, you can come and not ever learn Spanish, but Loja is different that way. So it brings a very interesting person and people that uh, we welcome every day at Zarza. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing that, uh, that came to mind that I think a lot of people want to hear about who haven't been here is... And I think one of the things I like most about here is talk a little bit about your family life and, you know, the work-life balance and how that works for you and your family. Yeah, you know, uh, a lot of people in Loja, uh, locals, et cetera, they all, they, a lot of them have local, have, what are they, uh, they're self-employed, they have their own businesses. And, um, you know, it gives you a lot of free time, well, uh, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, you create your own time, you know. Uh, you can plan your own day. Uh, instead of working eight hours, you get to work 16. You just get to choose the 16 <laughs> hours you're going to work. But at the same time, I mean, you choose the time you get to be with your family. Uh, uh, is great for family atmosphere. It's just small enough uh, that you don't feel like there's um, a lot of, uh, would you say, well, I don't, I mean, I know there's drugs and things everywhere in the world, but uh, here it's not in your face. No. I mean, you don't know where to go to look for them. Like, I don't, I don't know anywhere, you know, no. I'm sure there's some place maybe, but haven't heard of it. So right. uh, it's small <laughs> enough where, where I don't think there's like um, those negative things are really established in certain areas. So it's really a great family atmosphere. There's lots of schools um, to choose from, uh, lots of parks, interesting parks, uh, bigger and smaller um yeah it's a good place for for family yeah i mean i've i've noticed and you know darnell and i have discussed this before but i've noticed here with children you, that kind of old time respect exists it's like you don't you don't you know children here are very respectful you know they're going to say good morning they're going to say good afternoon they're going to you know treat adults with respect they listen to their parents um you know you don't have that kind of delinquent culture here <laughs> um, where kids are you know you don't see kids you know smoking weed and you know doing graffiti that's that's yeah. not here <laughs> yeah it doesn't it doesn't exist here i mean people uh keep their children in line you know uh i worked as a bilingual teacher in the in texas for a little while and uh always the recent immigrants were the best behaved you know like they have the pastor the teacher and the parent are like sort of the three main uh figures in their lives and they authority figures and they really they respect them most for the most part Mm. Yeah. And then um, about schooling, where do your kids go to school? They go to uh, Amauta, uh, the same school as Jesse's uh, daughter goes to. Mm -hmm. It's a um, private school uh, up uh, 30 minutes into the mountains. They have a lot of science-based teaching, nature-based teaching, uh, a lot of open thinking. Uh, it's it's pretty cool for, uh, you know, you wouldn't think Loja being as small as it is would have such an alternative uh, school and education format. So 
it's a great benefit. I had my kids previously in another school, which was a stereotypical uh, private school, and uh, they were. It was a good, well, it was a decent teaching environment. The, my kids learned a lot, but it just was uh, all worksheets and you know regurgitation, and they were able to do it. But it's just not really what we're looking for. So, yeah, we enjoy our, their new school. Yeah. And I, I assume you've probably traveled a bit in Ecuador. You mentioned earlier, but you lived in Vilcabamba and have seen some other places. What are what are some places that stick out for you in terms of places you enjoy to go to or you would recommend people checking out within Ecuador or maybe some places that um, you know are, are on lists that you don't don't enjoy so much? Yeah, uh, you know, I like um, Alone. It's a beach town right outside of Montanita. Mm -hmm. Montanita sort of the sort of the New Orleans of Ecuador, I think, you know, it's a good way to describe it. Yeah. Very. I mean, it's like, it's always midnight, New Year's Eve there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right. I mean, you know, when you're younger, that might be a thing or an interesting thing or even for older people who knows, depending on your lifestyle. But once you have kids, it's kind of, you don't want to take them there, but the town right around the mountains is alone. And it's a small community. I bet 2000 to 5,000 people, but with a huge beach, I mean, a much bigger beach than Montanita. And uh, things are a little le uh, less expensive and just really peaceful. It's so great. We go there. We, we've been there probably six to seven times in the last three years. Uh, you know, before I had, uh, I only had one kid, and um, we used to go to the, they call it El Oriente, you know, like going to the jungle, mm -hmm. the Amazon. And there's, you can actually get, to, get there from here in about four and a half to five hours from Loja, going through Zamora. Mm -hmm. And then you go down to... Uh, Nangaritsa uh, uh, Alto, and then there's Bajo, and uh, those that's a river uh, basin, and uh, it's really unexploited touristically. Like there's no not a lot of tourism there, uh, but you kind of create your own your own adventure, you know. So you show up. I remember last time we went there was um, we were in uh, Las Orquídeas, like the orchids, you know, and it's a town. It's a native uh, town, indig indigenous town, and. Uh, they have tons of wood they're um, harvesting all the time. I don't know how legal or whatever all that is, because uh, it's kind of out there in the boonies, but uh, amazing woods. I mean, I remember seeing boards of what they call purple heartwood. A whole board of this thing was like $5. Of course, you can't bring it back because there's checkpoints on the way. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the fun thing I did with my family was uh, these taxis, you know, they have these boats that go down the rivers and they're taxis and you can hire one for a trip. They have these tours that they'll do for you for like five bucks a person, like three hours. And I mean, you go down these rivers and it's like what you would see in a National Geographic, you know, massive river with these crazy canyons and waterfalls everywhere. I mean, just, and then the, they have these hiking trails you can, that they've worked out themselves to go other cascades. Really cool. And I mean, that's something that costs nothing. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know about. We just sort of explored out there. We'd heard, you know, there's stuff to do. So, yeah, that's a special place. And I think, you know, questions I get sometimes when people are, you know, haven't been here but are thinking about coming, they ask things like, you know, is travel safe? So, you know, you're just mentioning you went into a loan. It's a place that I've been a couple of times as well. It's, I don't know, give or take eight hours of driving from Loja. You're talking about this other place in the jungle you went. That's you know, four or five hours, you said? Yeah, about five hours. About five, five hours. Any issues with travel, no. safety, any of those kinds of things? No, that's funny. I mean, I never even think about that. I mean, I might think about if I'm going to find a gas station. That's like about it. But that wasn't even an issue, you know. But, yeah. Yeah, I never f feel uh, unsafe. I mean, in, in Guayaquil at night, in any city at night, Loja, really late at night, you know, you take precautions. Although here, I mean, I don't really feel like there's any uh, really safety issues. I think there's probably, uh, I know there is um, petty theft, you know, that goes on. Uh, but violent crime is very minimal, you know. I mean, the U.S. is a much more violent place sure. than Ecuador <laughs> by far, so... Yeah, I think yeah. back home you're just kind of conditioned to think that that um, you know back home is safe and everywhere outside of the United States is dangerous or outside of the Western world maybe is is dangerous. And yeah, the media. I think that's yeah. that's kind of a uh, something that's interesting about coming here after being here as long as you have or as long as we have and getting to see firsthand that I think it's important to let people know back home. Yeah, I mean the schools. Uh, 
they don't lock the doors, you know? I mean, they do sometimes. I remember the last school my kids were in uh, for a couple of years, you know, you could just walk right in there at certain times of the day and uh, they don't check you in, they don't search you, you don't go through metal detectors, you know? And uh, um, I remember my parents came to visit me uh, two years ago, one December, and uh, they were, they were it, it made them extremely uncomfortable that we could just walk into my kid's school. I'm just like, you know, it's a different world. It's a different world, yeah. yeah. Right. They did not like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that conditioning, you know, carries over. It t- it's an adjustment, those kinds of things. I would say, in general, precautions are just not taken here for most things. And I personally think that's much nicer. Yeah, um, yeah I agree. I mean, the over, you know, what, what would you call it? Like, taking off your shoes and stuff at the airport. I mean, I, I bet it makes some people think they feel safer, you know? But come on. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can you can actually fly here, um, you know, domestically with as much liquid as you would like. Uh, for example, you know, <laughs> yeah. I was I had was traveling to Guayaquil for an international flight, so I was flying from Loja to Guayaquil, and I brought you know a gallon of water with me to to drink at the Guayaquil <laughs> airport before I got on the other airplane, and you know went right through no problem oh yeah you know yeah no shoes off uh on on international flights of course you yes but on domestic flights no yeah yeah i I think last year when i went to europe though because i didn't fly american airlines i flew uh was it klm or something Mm -hmm. to madrid like i didn't have to take my shoes off for that flight they didn't search my bag after you know once you go through the duty-free stores they didn't search you but if you're getting on american airlines flight sure get ready the U.S. the U.S. style yeah. quote security. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the airports here are beautiful. Yeah, they've really done a good job. The Catamayo one's really nice. I remember eight or nine years ago, it wasn't like that, but it was sort of your typical out in the middle of nowhere third world airport. But now, I mean, it's classy. Yeah, know? yeah. I mean, it's it's nicer than any of the airports in New York. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And only about 40 minutes away from the city. Yeah, yeah. So fairly easy to get to. It is. Yep. And, you know, there's big deals, too, right, on flights all the time. We're uh, flying in June next year. And we're already just looking at the internal flights. I mean, they're $18 for the two weeks we're going. If you get them really early. If you get yeah. them early. $18. Yeah. I mean, of course, with tax, it's like 38 but still. <laughs> <laughs> That's like one way to Quito from Loja. Yeah. <laughs> it's cheaper than the bus, almost. Yeah, we were joking when we first came. You know, we were, we were looking at tickets, and, you know, on several of them, the taxes were more expensive than exactly. the ticket. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, no, that's how they get you, because yeah. they have the uh, the national airline, Tommy, is owned by the, it's part owned by the Air Force. Mm-hmm. So they charge the taxes to the private operators, and the ta- they end up being the same price, but they make more money on the competitor flights than they do on their own in taxes. Oh, it's a good strategy. Yeah, huh. government yeah, monopoly, yeah. baby. <laughs> well, they did just sell the Petro Ecuador. Did you see that? The the government decided they didn't want to be in the retail gasoline business anymore. So yeah, I did read out. about yeah, that. Yeah. I did read about. No, that. super is going up. Super gasoline. Yeah, it's still going to be two dollars and twelve cents for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's another thing that that lots of people don't know about Ecuador. And we were chatting about this last week. Is that you know they're the smallest producer in OPEC. So you've got mm-hmm. it's very cheap to you know they travel, great infrastructure, great roads, great bridges. We we're just talking about airports that we have here in, in Loja, um, you know, being st- oh, nicer than some of the airports in New York City. Um, that's what I think is is really in, one of the interesting things about here. Yeah, I mean, the roads are definitely better in Louisiana, you know, like all through Ecuador. I mean, I was just in, uh, uh, what's it called, Naranjo Dulce. Have you heard of this place? It's uh, the last parroquia or little town on the way from Malacatos on the road to Catamayo. Mm -hmm. And uh, before you get to this bridge where you're all of a sudden in Catamayo, uh, that's called uh, Naranjo I don't know why it's Naranjo, but Naranjo Dulce. Close to Tambo, are you saying? Yeah, I don't know any other places mm-hmm. out there. This mm-hmm. is my first time out there, but it's like you're going, and you're in the middle of nowhere. Very beautiful, ridiculously beautiful. But the roads, like, you know, it's not completely paved yet, but they're paving that thing all the way to Catamayo. It's like, I mean, yeah, I've yeah, heard about pretty that. amazing. Yeah, yeah, and they're also paving the road uh, <laughs> going past the airport to Gonzalo. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. Huh. 
So yeah, it's uh, very, very well done, the infrastructure here. So, and for now it's being maintained. Right. So. Um, let's, let's uh, very briefly dive into prices. So, you know, you've, you've probably, I, and you can, you know, confirm or deny, you've probably got the most expensive beer in Loja, I would imagine. Uh, probably. There's probably some imported uh, beers well, that, have, that have recently disappeared because of taxes, okay. but that were uh, seven to eight dollars a bottle, you know, for some German ales. Right. So you're in your beers. You're you're serving what? Maybe sixteen ounce glasses normally. Yeah, we have two sizes: uh, pints and then uh, your standard three hundred milliliter, three hundred or twelve ounce. Okay. Yeah. And what's the what's your What's the normal average price tag on a beer? Uh, like three seventy-five for a pint, which is still cheaper than the U.S. And then right. uh, four twenty-five for our strong ales. Anything above seven and a half percent. Right. So I mean, just as a point of comparison, you know, that's I mean, in New York, that those were twelve-dollar glasses of beers. Yeah. Um, you know, eight at eight if it was Budweiser or something. But this is you know micro brewed, very high quality, and often very high alcohol content um, beers. You're charging what for like a burger, for example? A burger, they go from five to six twenty-five. Right. So again, so that would be you know if you if you're doing a price comparison in your head, if you think of your um, local, you know, mm, sports bar is maybe the wrong term because Greg's bar is is really um, you know it's it's classier than that, it's higher end than that. Um, so I don't know, you know, maybe a, a TGA Fridays, but you know, not a not a chain, you know, a TGI Fridays that serves you know micro brewery beer and you know is owned by a local but is but is really high quality so that would be your sort of your comparison if you're thinking in prices and you know you're paying what you know maybe 12 bucks for a burger um back home in a place like that uh, you know maybe 16 if it's a burger with all kinds of toppings and stuff you're paying you said five and six yeah five to six twenty five depending on the burger yeah. and they're you know three eighths of a pound i mean they're pretty well done uh yeah. well, well uh yeah pretty big we make our own bread too. We do a lot of stuff to try to create quality in our products. Um, and you know, we we're able to make our beer at that price, but our cost of productions are much higher than a brewery in the States. I mean, you have a uh, local grain in the States, local hops. I mean, you know, Ecuador on the equator, we can't produce, we can produce um, barley, but there's no malters here. I mean, that's a whole nother science. So everything comes from Belgium, uh, Germany, New Zealand for hops, Australia, the U S so, and then, you know, when it gets to Guayaquil, often we share containers with people in Quito. Well, the majority goes up there and they have to pay more to bring it down here. So, I mean, our cost of production are higher than anybody in Ecuador and much higher than anybody in, in the States. But mm -hmm. yet, you know, we're able to keep our costs where they are. For what we sell for, we, you know, here they price things on in the microbrewery industry on the liter, you know, cost per liter. So let's say 375 for a pint, that's about a half liter. We sell our beer for 750 a liter. But if you go to to Quito, especially in the Mariscal, the sort of hip tourist area, area. Tourist area yeah, um, you're looking at nine to $15 a liter for micro brewed beers, you know, mm. and yet their cost of production are less than us. We just have to take into consideration that we're in Loja. Right. So we can't price ourselves out of a small city. Yeah, I mean, that's another, you know, you bring up an interesting point in terms of regional costs in Ecuador. You know, you can rent a, a nice apartment in Loja for three, four hundred dollars. In Guayaquil, you're looking at eight hundred or a thousand. That's right. It's yeah. it's very interesting how different prices vary by region here. Yeah. And then in here, I mean, you know, you get beat up on uh, things that aren't produced here, you know, yeah. like which is most things, social products. So uh, electronics, beer, whatever, it's, well, not the big multinational producer, but for local beer, you know, you get beat up a little because the costs are a little higher. You know, there's an extra shipping uh, fee added in to get from Guayaquil to Cuenca de Loja. So, yeah, I mean, so what are some of those supply chain challenges that you run into running a business here that uses a lot of imported goods? I know, I mean, um, there's so many import taxes for us. That's been, you know, when we when we look at businesses where we've got to import a lot of things, it it seems daunting in terms of. Uh, you know, the steps you'd have to go through. Talk a little bit about the supply chain stuff. Yeah, depending on uh, your products, if it's uh, if they're manufactured goods, there's there's a different uh, process you go through to get your import license. If it's an agricultural product, there's another group you have to go through before you get the standard import license, which is called Agro Calidad here in town. 
so you set that up, stuff get stuff gets moving, takes a couple months, you know, for things to get here, and then uh, you have to hire a, an agents. Uh, what's it called? Um, a gente de aduanas. Uh, uh, customs agent. Customs agent. Yeah. Uh, in order to they they're like licensed by the customs people, but they're private workers, contractors, and then you hire them to move your goods through the system. You have 10 days to get it out and then if you don't your containers charge like 100 bucks a day in tariffs like fees you know because it's the containers rented to you by the the shipping company and uh you have to put deposits in to get the thing moving through the country to make sure they're not going to steal it you know and then uh so it's a it's a pain in the butt but uh yeah but you know we love what we do so we go through it and I mean, just like anything, once you learn the the ropes, it's easier to do. You still don't like doing it, but it's it's easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, we were just, uh, you know, talking about the restaurant we have. We were um, doing this Oktoberfest thing, and uh, my big thing right now is is I'm into cooking, you know, and trying to bring our restaurant up. I'll always make it better, you know. So for Oktoberfest, we're doing uh, we made our own bratwursts. I've never done that before. Stuffed sausages. Very interesting experience. And I uh, <laughs> uh, did it for the second time yesterday. And uh, that first time, I think it took us three hours just to make, you know, 20 brats. And then uh, yesterday, it took us about 45 minutes. So, I mean, just amazing what you learn over time and how to do things better. So, anything can be accomplished. And would you say, you know, given all the hoops that you have to jump through, mm-hmm. that the business opportunity um, is worth it? Oh, heck yeah. Yep. Profitability uh, wise and all those. Things. Oh yeah. Yep. It's definitely worth it. So, uh, yeah, we don't have any regrets. It's funny. We were offered an opportunity to do the same project in Texas and it was really bizarre, but my dad, he offered to, uh, f- uh, front the business, the capital, if, um, if, and he would take half the business and then I would work it, you know, but in Texas, and then uh, Alita's dad got in on the bidding, and That's he said, your wife? "Yeah, my yeah. wife. Yep, her, my father-in-law." He said, uh, "Well, if you come to Ecuador, I'll let you use my land." You know, and uh, we we're like, "Hmm, that's interesting proposition." So we chose him, and now we actually bought the building uh, where we're at. So um, yeah, it's a good choice, and uh, we'd much rather have our family, our kids, living here in Loja than where I was in a suburb of Dallas. So and also a lot less competition. For in now, the craft, in the craft brewery, it's brewery. true in southern Ecuador. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few in Cuenca, three two and a half hours away from here, you know, but uh, they're not very good. You know, the, the benefit we have is my uh, my palate. I have a lot of experience um, trying beer, and uh, so <laughs> I know what it should taste like. <laughs> Well, there goes the diplomacy, huh? When we're talking <laughs> about competitors, it's out the window. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of people, you know, they, they start a business and uh, they don't, they're, they're looking at, you know, making some money and it's a new industry. So really any startup, at least for the next six months, now that there's a lot of bottles on the market, people are going to start weeding out the ones that aren't really valuable. And uh, so for now, I mean, sure anybody can sell a product you know until people really develop their palates and then uh things will change and by a lot of bottles greg means you know a few (laughs) Um, few. you know if you go to uh the 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 some of the you know the best or a couple of best liquor stores in town or you go to super maxi which is the largest and most popular supermarket you know you're not going to find more than at the at the uh liquor stores you know maybe four or five different kinds of beers at super maxi maybe a few more because they would carry a few more of the international beers that are you know priced to u.s or higher prices because of the import taxes um but so you know greg's in a business where you know he can bring a microbrew beer on the market and not be competing with hundreds of others um even in your case you probably i mean how many microbreweries are there in the whole country maybe 10 or something no or? i think there's like 60 now 60 yeah oh really but uh 50 of them are in Quito. Sure. Yeah, so... So they just don't reach us, I guess. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, I think we have about four or five that are on the shelves. Uh, and most in Quito, it's mostly uh, a lot of kegging, and there's bars that are set up just for particular microbrews, so... Okay, so I should have asked the question in terms of bottled, yeah. Yeah, bottlers, there's not many. I mean, that's a very, very, very new thing. Right. The, the government just changed some of the processes for getting your um, sanitary permit, and uh, so it's a lot more streamlined, mm-hmm. and uh, so things will change quickly. And Supermax, you know, they're required to have 30% local products this year on their shelves. Oh, is that right? 
they're not supposed to be importing as much and uh the, the fine for that is 33 percent of their revenues Ooh. if they don't make make the cut so yeah they got to keep the dollars in the country that's right it's like a billion dollars of a, ta- a, a, a multa you know a, a fine you're gonna yeah. get this year so wow if they don't com- com- uh, complete what they're required to do so yeah it's kind of a good thing i mean it's nice to see local local products on the shelves but it's also you know, if, if something can't be created locally or isn't being created locally, it shouldn't be taxed. I, this is a personal opinion, but, you know. Well, it's, it's the coercion that rubs me the wrong yeah. way. I think the end result is a good one, but how they get there is yeah is uh, is the problematic part of it. Yeah. But, but even putting that into perspective, you've got 60... You've got 60 breweries for a country of 16 million people? Oh, yeah. The, the ratio is still in the favor of the brewer, and it will be for at least another couple of years. I mean, this happened in the 90s in the States, uh, right. the first microbrewery boom, and then everybody went broke, and then all the equipment was cheap, and now we're in the second you know, rise. I mean, it's over a brewery a day in the United States opens every day. Uh, here, it's probably every 20 days, you know. So saturation will take longer to get to, but it'll be here someday, mm-hmm. just like any industry. If there's if there's money to be made, people are going to enter it. I mean, there's a new brewery in Cuenca. Very interesting. These guys, um, it's a, a multinational. I'm not going to name names, but uh, they just spent two and a half million dollars on a brewery to bring in from Europe. Brought in a brewmaster, and they're just pumping beer out, and they don't care about beer. You know, they just care about money and. Uh, there's a hole in the market and so they're going to exploit it you know mm. i mean it's natural it's sure. capitalism so yeah other thing about your distribution you've also sold kegs as well too to, to other businesses yeah we have uh kegs in two locations in Vilcabamba. we have bottles in one store uh we've got kegs here uh, another tap system in uh, a pizza place a really nice pizza place in our neighborhood uh, another one in um, a cafeteria so yeah we're uh we got our we got four different uh keg systems or dispensing systems out there and then uh right now we're just moving on to the bottles one in machala as well uh that one came back it kept breaking oh okay uh we had we had a system built here shipped it to machala uh the weather was different i mean they, this is a outdoor bar super high class really nice place um but it broke twice in the six weeks that it was out there and then uh they just said no they didn't they couldn't deal with it mm-hmm. so they're going to take on our bottles though oh great uh-huh and you know logistically i'm new at this business and uh you know it's better to start locally regionally learn the ropes and to manage something four hours four and a half hours away it's, it's just it's a little bit difficult for right now we don't have people out there mm-hmm. so and uh We've talked a little bit about distribution and the industry in general. What do you think is, what would help you take your business to the next level? I mean, we were talking about investment earlier on in the show. Would, it, would taking on some investment capital help you grow your business at this point? Or Yeah, it would. I mean, we've looked into that as well. We, we could line up financing pretty quick. We have people outside that are interested. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we don't want to, we're not ready to let go of control our business but uh yeah definitely i mean our maybe we'll be left behind we'll see what happens but our idea right now is to do it all personally and run it off of capital produced during uh our bottling i mean we we at our bar and four other bars we sell off 35 percent of our production so i mean we have 65 percent left to sell outside the door Mm -hmm. uh which doesn't have any you know operating costs in the sense of lighting and uh seating you know so uh that's our goal right now, but uh, we would be open to, to offers always. Yep. And um, if people want to reach you or if people want to find you, do you have a website that they can go to or any information you want to give in that regard? Yeah, our website is uh, .com. Uh You can find us there. We have a form that you can ask questions on, uh, which would be info at zarzabrewing.com is the, the email that that's linked to. Uh, there's more information about our business on there. There's a little video uh, that's up now too about um, the bar itself. You know, uh, done by local producers. Um, yeah, we have a Facebook page, but if you're not on Facebook, the good thing is we have our Facebook page linked to a news uh, page on our website, so that for people without Facebook, you can still read the the news feed and see what's happening daily at the bar too. 
Great, great. Well, I wanted to uh, thank you for joining us, Greg. I think that was really helpful for all of our listeners um, to just get your perspective on business and family life here in, in Loja, Ecuador. Yeah, no problem. Great. Um, so we'll see all of you guys next week for our next podcast. Thanks and have a great day, everybody.